to the trading bell we have set up right here to have a conversation with the group managing director that's Martin Ching of Sassini PLC quite an optimistic company looking at how they did over the last year and their full year results but first before we get into the conversation let's take a look at his profile Martin Ching is the group managing director Sassini PLC Kenya Mr. Ocheng is a holder of a Master of Business Administration degree in Strategic Marketing and Management from Oxford Brookes University, England, and a First Class Honours Bachelor of Science degree from Moy University. His career spans over 28 years of experience in international trade, business management and leadership in industry leading global organizations. He started work from 3M Healthcare as a medical representative in charge of Western Kenya region before joining Wana Lambert in 1997 as a territory manager covering Western Kenya, Eastern Uganda and Northwestern Tanzania regions. In the early millennium, he moved with Pfizer to South Africa as head of marketing for Sub-Saharan African markets. He has held several leadership roles in various organizations including KWV International as Head of Global Marketing, at Tyco International as Marketing and Strategy Director for Africa and Middle East Region and later as Managing Director for Tyco Commercial Services for the region, as CEO of GHM South Africa and as MD of SGA Kenya. He is the current Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Global Compact Network Kenya and the auspicious of United Nations Global Compact, which is the world's leading corporate sustainable initiative as well as a board member of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. He joined Sassini PLC on 1st March 2019. Martin Ocheng, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's Thanks it, for having me. It, it's been about three years or so since you started on the trading I think it's four years. I was last here <laughs> in... Uh, mm. <laughs> so yes, much three years. It's March 2020, I think. Wow. Just as COVID was breaking out. Can you believe that? Yeah. Yeah. And first of all, let me start the conversation by congratulating you and your leadership because we we were very keen to follow some of your uh, recent events and one of it was that you released your 2022 full year results. They were quite impressive. Congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank we'll you. be discussing that for now first. But before I get there, let me, let's talk about your company, Sassini, and uh, the fact that you have been quite innovative. Uh, in terms of diversifying and all that kind of thing. And I'm sure shareholders will be really willing to hear what's, what's going down there from the CEO side of things. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, innovation is one of our key strategic platforms. Uh, when, when I came in in 2019, uh, when it, it was basically a tea and coffee business, if you remember. Yes. Uh, we are a 71-year-old entity that has, uh, you know, moved ourselves into being the region's biggest agricultural business. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that has driven that is uh, four or five years ago when we decided to delve into other crops away from tea and coffee just to reduce our reliance on those two crops, but also to give us new revenue streams, new profit centers uh, that we can use to then you know, catapult ourselves into being the continent's biggest agribusiness, which is our goal. Mm -hmm. uh, that has worked quite well. So we went into avocado and macadamia nuts. Mm -hmm. um, we sell 100% of our avocados into Western Europe, oh. uh, Germany, Netherlands, France, and the UK. Mm -hmm. And we sell almost 90% of our macadamia nuts into North America and the oh. US market specifically. Okay. And then the other 10% goes to Europe as well. Mm -hmm. On top of tea and coffee that we've traditionally sold from countries in the Far East, you know, Japan and South Korea, to you know, America and Canada on, on the West and mm -hmm. everything in between, especially Asia. Pakistan is our biggest client and consumer, not just of Sassini tea, but uh, Kenyan tea at large. Wow. You know, the last time we talked, you were thinking of just getting into that business, and it's good to hear the results of what you're doing there. Mm. Um, let me, first of all, just push you back, because looking at the success, because I call it success, because I, from what you said and the results that you released, it seems that your market is stable and all that. Um, but we also see in competitors, as in your field as well, diversify into quite similar products. Mm. Is this something that you are concerned about, or the market is wide? <laughs> No, the market is wide. There's enough for everybody. Okay. And our philosophy is, uh, you know, our strategy drives what we do mm -hmm. and how we structure our organization. Mm -hmm. And so what's critical for us is if we get into a business unit or a business angle, we do it properly. Okay. In fact, mm -hmm. what then helps the whole sector is if you have many players in it. Mm -hmm. it, it helps, that competition helps you to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have to remember that we're not doing this just for Sassini, we're doing this for the country as well. Yeah. We 
we are a big source of uh, all this agricultural produce that uh, we are engaged in. Kenya is the biggest uh, uh, exporter of black tea. Yeah. Um, and uh, we are, I think, in the top 10 uh, in terms of uh, macadamia as well. In fact, I think we are fourth after Australia and South Africa um, in growing and exporting macadamia. And we've been active in macadamia for a long okay. time. Uh, we are now bigger than South Africa in exporting avocados wow. uh, you know, out of the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we can't be afraid of competition. In fact, we need more and more farmers uh, because the benefit of the work we do is not just for the corporates and the profits we make, mm -hmm. uh, but the general farmer population in the outgrower schemes that we run as well. So competition is good as long as it enhances quality, it enhances uh, the, the, the national supply of this produce globally, uh, we are good with it. Great. Mm. So you released your results 2022 and um, I don't want to get into the uh, details of it but the question for me is what are your key highlights because from the uh, perspective of what we saw um, your shareholders are happy people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I hope they are. I mean that's that's the intention uh, is, is to give them back because of the investment they put into the organization mm -hmm. over the 71 years we've been in existence. Mm -hmm. uh, so that performance if I could take you back to the last time we spoke in yes. March 2020 we had just closed our 2019 year. We'd lost close to 400 million after tax. I know. And uh, things were looking very gloomy. Mm -hmm. COVID just hit. And we didn't know it was going to take two years. It mm -hmm. did. In fact, some of the ill effects of that pandemic are still being felt in business today, yeah. in logistics, uh, in some of the markets that we sell our products to. Mm -hmm. um, we then uh, you know, set on a, on a new strategic platform to try and reverse the results that uh, I found in the organization. Uh, around six key pillars, mm -hmm. uh, driving a performance culture, mm -hmm. seriously tackling cost containment and, uh, and wastage, yeah. uh, sharpening our commercial aspects of the way we do business, yeah. uh, focusing on our talent, the people that work in the organization and, and what they do for us because we have excellent people in the business. Mm -hmm. um, being financially focused in giving these good results to make sure that we have enough to pay back to our shareholders. Mm -hmm. And lastly, doing all those things on a sustainable bedrock uh, of sustainable business uh, under the SDGs. Yeah. And that strategy was then aimed to deliver uh, for us from that loss of 400 million yeah. in 2019, mm -hmm. a profit after tax we targeted of 1 billion. Mm -hmm. We achieved that in 2022, wow. one and a half years ahead of its target. And so wow. now we are faced with the prospect of, you know, what else do we do? This strategy has achieved <laughs> this result. We need a new one. And, and so the board and, uh, and management are working on one as we speak mm -hmm. uh, to then take us to probably double that result that you saw last year. Mm -hmm. So the key driver of the, of the 1.2 billion we made up to tax last year is that our tea business was very strong, mm -hmm. uh, coming off improvements in quality uh, of the tea we produce, mm -hmm. but also driven by reduction in costs because of our mechanization program, which is one of the innovative things we did. Uh, we moved from not being mechanized at all in our tea harvesting in 2019 yeah. to 100% of our estates being mechanized in harvesting mm -hmm. uh, in 2022. Mm -hmm. and, and so that gave us a very good, uh, not just efficiency, but cost reduction. Uh, and so that contributed to profit as well. Our coffee business was very strong that year. Uh, yeah. We sold at an average of six and a half dollars a kilo, mm -hmm. some of the highest prices we've seen in the recent past. Our macadamia business finished very strongly, uh, okay. contributing almost 30% of that profit. Wow. Uh, and that just shows you the potential of new business if mm -hmm. you launch it well and, mm -hmm. and uh, you target the market properly and what it can do. And that was then buoyed by our fruit business as well going to Europe, which is beginning to stabilize now because okay. that's the only perishable line of products that we've got. Mm -hmm. So it's got more peculiar challenges than the other three lines, mm -hmm. uh, but we're seeing a lot of stability there. And so we are, we are very happy with the progress we are making mm -hmm. uh, in all those areas. We'll continue yeah. to look at you know, areas to diversify in to see whether there are other crops you can get into. Mm -hmm. Obviously with large scale okay. and export as the two drivers. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm keen to look into, you know, your performance. Of course, very profitable this time round and of course new strategy coming up as you've said. Mm -hmm. And there were certain headwinds. Of course, we came from COVID the last time we talked yes, about. Yes. I'm sure now 
you know, headwinds keep changing over and over the time. Mm. What are the challenges that you're now uh, looking at addressing or even facing currently as we go? Uh, there are very many. First of all, let's go back to COVID. Uh, with the effects of COVID, COVID is still with it's us. Still. I think a lot of people... <laughs> By the way, I saw numbers being released still. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if you look at them keenly, mm. uh, they're not good. Uh, yeah. I think the only thing that is giving us some reprieve is that uh, a lot of us are vaccinated, and so the effect of that is now lessened. It's become a community disease, and so it's like a common cold, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you're seeing less negative effect from it on business. But it did affect business for mm -hmm. those two years that it was around. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in two areas, mainly for us is, uh, you know, the doubling, in some cases, tripling of logistic costs, especially to the, wow. to the west coast of the U.S. where we send our nuts uh, to. Uh, be, just because there's no availability of containers. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of containers are stuck in China mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're starting to see those costs coming down. Mm -hmm. And we work very strongly in partnership with uh, Musk as our main shipping line, but with many other shipping lines as well, uh, to manage those costs down. Okay. So th that's now okay, but still a headwind. Mm -hmm. And then as if that was not enough, we had this crisis in Europe with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Those are the two biggest suppliers of components that go into fertilizer manufacture for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so we saw when that broke out, uh, a bag of fertilizer, 50 kg bag of fertilizer, uh, moving from 2,500 shillings to 7,500 shillings. Mm -hmm. And for us, we're a large scale user of fertilizer, not just for our estates, but for our outgrower programs as well. Mm -hmm. There was an increase in cost that only now is starting to come down uh, because we're finding alternative and creative ways of, uh, of managing that. Mm -hmm. And then this year we are seeing very many other challenges. We've just come off uh, a six month drought from October last year to around April this year, which is the worst in 50 years. We've mm -hmm. not seen drought that severe okay, right. uh, since 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we are a rain fed business. Mm -hmm. So when there's no rain, uh, we suffer a lot. We lost almost half of our production in the tea business. Mm -hmm. uh, our coffee production has been compromised as well. The avocado season is later than usual mm -hmm. and less in volume because of that drought. And so we are going through, despite having very good results last year, mm. a very difficult current year. Uh, and then lastly, uh, two things just to mention. One is the collapse of the coffee price. Mm -hmm. Because Brazil, yeah, after the effects of COVID, being the world's biggest producer of coffee, mm -hmm. has come back with uh, slightly higher volumes than normal. And so that has driven the coffee prices down from $6.5 a kilo last year to just under four dollars now Whoa. and four dollars is really the cost of production of a kilo of coffee in mm -hmm. kenya and so mm -hmm. there's very little money being made there at the moment and that's a problem yeah and then uh, for us the biggest uh, negative effect has been uh, the collapse of the u.s market in driving consumption of nuts mm. uh, you know so that being our main market for macadamia nuts uh, because of the recession going on there mm -hmm. uh, consumers are using disposable income for other uh, useful expenses and so snacking has gone down to almost zero and so we are seeing ve very little demand not just for macadamia nuts mm -hmm. but for nuts generally it it will turn uh, but as long as it is with us that's a challenge and those are the headwinds we are facing now okay yeah. wow quite quite a mouthful mm -hmm. and i hope that you certainly i mean you will you will you will see uh, uh, ways out of this in terms of your uh, you know ability to really lead like you did from uh, not making profits to where we are. Thank you. Let me move on straight to uh, a bit of what I see in the agricultural sector. Of late, I have seen a lot of innovations popping up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, agri and tech. In fact, we have agri tech forums. Yes. And I'm keen to ask whether these are things that you are really as well taking in your interest so that at least you're not left behind when we say that. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the uh, opportunities that you foresee in you know embracing these particular innovations? That you see? some of the uh, opportunities that you foresee in you know embracing these particular innovations that we see we are at the forefront of driving that uh, a lot of people look at agriculture and think it's just basic tilling of the land to get produce that you then convert into products to consume mm -hmm. there's a lot of science in there starting mm -hmm. from the soil science crop science then the production science that goes into <laughs> the engineering of 
producing these crops yeah. and then converting into the art of marketing and selling into the global fields, especially if you're a global player like Sassini is. And so it is not that simple. We run our business based on data. Uh, 71 years of collecting this data gives you a plethora of things to consider, a lot of insights to look at. And so um, with the advancement in technology now, the analysis of this data, uh, the deriving of insights from this data to help you make decisions around where you want uh, that data to help you is what's driving the innovation. And we do some of them, when you do get to the answers, you think, mm, this is really simple. Why did I think of this? I'll give you a couple of examples. Yeah. <laughs> in our tea business, um, we've had a, a long history of uh, moving our our finished product from factory uh, through warehousing in Mombasa and then into the port, uh, into our markets. Yeah. Uh, every time you handle tea, you reduce its quality and so what you want to try and do is reduce the handling of that tea. Mm -hmm. And we worked with a key logistics partner, Musk, to you know, sort of like bypass the warehousing component in Mombasa and move tea straight from our, our factories to the port, reducing oh. handling and the time that we were spending in there. Mm. And we just looked at data and data told us we were wasting time by taking this thing to the port. Wow. And if we move the processing of the, the, the port uh, processes yeah. from Mombasa to the factory, we could catch almost a week out. Oh. Uh, and so we've done that. Another um, uh, innovative thing that we're doing now is uh, over the years, seven decades to be exact, uh, we've applied fertilizer in our tea estates by broadcasting, so using your hand to sort of like spread the fertilizer. Mm. Effective, but human. Mm -hmm. And so it's fraught with error and efficiency issues. Okay. Now we're using drones. Oh. So whereas we used to, in our estates, and they're vast estates, it used to take us about two and a half months to do the whole estate. It's taking us 11 days now using drones. Again, efficiency and cost reduction there. Um, in our avocado business, just to give you some more examples, uh, we are moving our pack houses closer to the market so that the transport and the perishability that comes out of long distances is then reduced. Mm -hmm. And we are looking now at uh, putting even more pack houses very close to where the source of the fruit is. Mm -hmm. And that will help us to improve logistics, work with the, our partners as well, uh, to move that fruit quicker so that we can get it to the market faster than, than others. Uh, in our macadamia business, uh, we've developed our market very strongly in the U.S., uh, but the U.S., like we're seeing this year, cannot be the only market you're exporting nuts to. And so we're exploring Asia, we're exploring Western Europe as well, mm. uh, again using data to okay. see consumption and use for nuts in those markets and to see how that can be transferred back into commerce uh, for us as a company. So there's data everywhere. You obviously are aware of when we mechanized our, our tea plucking, mm -hmm. uh, how that drove our cost down by yeah. improving our efficiency. You're right. We'll continue to do that. Okay. Mm. This is off the cuff. Mm. When I look locally, we are importing food. And I'm talking about just the food crops we are basics, supposed to be yeah. having here. Yeah. And I'm keen to ask you, in terms of diversification, which I appreciate because you are really diversifying, mm. Have we thought about even maize itself? And why not? Because we need it here. There's always that thought. And, and the challenge is thrown to us a lot by government, <laughs> by players in some of these uh, food sectors that you're talking about. Uh, I, think, I think the answer is yes, we've thought about it and okay. we continue to. Mm -hmm. uh, our challenge is we are so driven by export because that's what we've done all along. And so we become experts in you know, production for the export market. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't really uh, want to supply the local market as well. In fact, when I joined in 2019, mm -hmm. we revamped our local supply of tea and coffee in our brands for Sassini Tea and Sassini Coffee in the local market. And, yeah. now, uh, and, and we decided to do it differently from the other players by packing the same export quality into those products to sell locally. Okay. And so there's a bit of our contribution into that. Um, I, I think what Kenya needs to do is to identify which foods are needed to alleviate the food crisis that we have, mm -hmm. if I could call it a crisis, mm -hmm. and then work with companies like Sassini to see how we can help uh, if we have available land or available technology or scale to then answer those local needs that, uh, that Kenya has. Yeah. Uh, so we are open to that if they, if they make commercial sense for us. Okay, okay. Yeah. And top of mind as well, looking at us, you know, Globally, we are looked at as a food basket. I yeah. mean, in terms of our, our climate situation and the likes, of course, there's so many factors that, as you've addressed, are hitting us hard. Mm. 
But what is, uh, do we have a lot of unexplored potential yet, in your opinion? Just looking yeah, from your so. perspective? Yeah, I think so. I really yeah. think so. And, and, and it, it may not be volumetric, as in how many avocado farmers we have, yeah. or how many people are growing a tree or three of uh, macadamia in their, in their backyards. I think where we do have a lot of opportunity is in elevating the quality to be at the global standard. Okay. Now, what you want to do mm -hmm. is have products that are relevant globally okay. so that you can access markets without any problem. Okay. Remembering that you're always competing other source markets as well. Mm -hmm. In tea, you're competing with other East African nations, yeah. but you're competing with the subcontinent uh, sources of uh, India and Sri mm -hmm. Lanka as well. In mm -hmm. coffee, Brazil and Vietnam are driving the industry now. In fact, Kenya has become a dwindled source of coffee over the years. We're only producing 40 million kilos of green beans. Mm -hmm. And 20 years ago, that number was 10 times higher. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and some of the things for that is how we manage these industries, the quality we generate out of uh, those products, and how we collectively can pull these industries together to work as a unit. Avocado is a good example mm -hmm. where, you know, we, we have uh, very stringent export rules around when you can export what quality uh, levels you need to reach before you export your fruit. So every year the government puts a ban between November and February to make sure that there are no people exporting immature fruit because that just goes to mess up brand Kenya in the yeah. fruit market. Yeah. Uh, and so if you ask me where the potential and explored potential is, is in the marketing uh, bit of it, mm -hmm. uh, in the packaging to be able to access global markets, in the production we are there. Okay. Mm. And finally, as you come to the tail end of this conversation, you mm. sit at the global uh, UN Global Kenya, um, and um, uh, it will be interesting to understand what you're doing at the Global Compact, especially with regards to you know, matter sustainability and all. Mm -hmm. And I think you've spoken uh, in the conversation how this has impacted your business, and we applaud you for that. But sitting at that particular seat, what's your mandate and what are you seeking to do with corporates that you're getting in, as well as the SMEs that you told me on the sideline are quite a number? Yeah, uh, just very quickly, the United Nations Global Compact is the world's leading corporate sustainability program. Okay. Uh, it was initiated in the year 2000 by the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, to help corporates like Sassini uh, to do business responsibly. Mm -hmm. uh, it ended up uh, you know, focusing on four key areas, mm -hmm. respect for human rights, yeah. uh, good labor practice in what we do, mm -hmm. uh, protection of the environment, mm -hmm and then anti-corruption as a mantra. Okay. In those four key areas, you've got 10 principles that drive what we need to do to achieve that. Yeah. And under those 10 principles are the 17 sustainable development goals. Okay. So those sustainable development goals are just formally for us to be able to act mm -hmm. and change the declining course that the world is taking mm -hmm. with the way business is being done now. In fact, the way business was being done 23 years ago. Yeah. And so, when the realization came. So uh, the way the UN Global Compact is then organized is a UN uh, uh, agency uh, that is split into what we call local networks in mm -hmm. each of the countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and Kenya is the strongest local network in Africa in mm -hmm. terms of membership, in terms of the work that we do and the impact that we create. Wow. We're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. One of the top 10 in, in the world. Wow. Uh, why? Because uh, we've been very successful in driving corporates to see uh, the need for us to be responsible in the way we run our mm -hmm. businesses. But where we've driven most success is with SMEs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 60% of our membership in this country is by SMEs. And why do we focus there? Because the influence of what the SMEs do mm -hmm. on the ground level in terms of creating jobs, uh, impacting the population with income, but more impo importantly, impacting either positive or negative effects into the environment is yeah. really critical. So if we can get them to see things the way we big corporates do see those things, mm -hmm. the effect is multiplied. And so we're very proud of the work we continue to do there. Sure. And, um, you know, we seek uh, more and more people to join the Global Compact. We have excellent programs, accelerator programs to help you mm -hmm. decide which of the SDGs you want to support, yeah. uh, where you can make a big difference uh, and how you can, can be a positive impact into the world. Let me end by saying, yeah. this generation we belong to is the generation that has completely degraded the environment, made the world a terrible place to live in. Oh. We were not born into this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in my 50s, and when I think about growing up in the 70s, some of the things we are talking about bringing back were there. That's mm -hmm. why we're talking about bringing them back, clean environments, recycling, you know, global temperatures that are stable. Uh, and why in the last 
three decades, we've done the exact opposite of what we needed to do. And so now we must surely be the generation that tries to reverse that. Absolutely. And so the effort uh, right from the Global Compact and the UN side to the government that we work with mm -hmm. and private sector in big corporates and SMEs is very important in achieving these yeah. goals. Yeah. Wow. Your parting shot will be back to the shareholders. Um, you give them some dividends. I think you mentioned that. And yes. uh, I would like you to as well just highlight, maybe someone has not checked their dividends, <laughs> but just highlight what we, you gave them. We paid our dividends uh, sometime in early June, uh, yes. just because of the process of closing the year and, uh, and how that uh, takes time. Yeah. Uh, I'm very proud to say in the four years I've been there, we paid dividends every year wow. uh, because we've been profitable in a, in a growing manner. Yeah. That 1.2 billion profit after tax we made last year is the highest we've made in our history, in our 70 year history. And our intention yeah. is to stay there and, mm -hmm. and keep improving that by looking for better ways of doing business uh, and generating more profit to be able to give back to the shareholders. We're, we're very grateful for the work they do for us, the trust they give us to run this organization. Mm. And so our parting shot to them is we'll do our best to keep that flowing. Your parting shot now, what's your one thing you would advise? There's, there's a leader there sitting there and saying, how did you turn this around? 70 years, highest profit done. What's your one thing that you could advise anybody who's probably in where you were when you picked uh, that particular position? I'd like to get that as advice as you end with your promise to shareholders. I think the biggest challenge for most business leaders is taking over an organization that is in problems. Yeah. There's no bigger problem than losing your shareholders' money. <laughs> And so, you know, what do you do when you're in a loss-making scenario and how mm -hmm. do you turn that around mm -hmm. of almost two billion shift in a four, three, four year period? Yeah. Yeah, the, the biggest opportunity in Sassini wasn't that it lacked strength in achieving results. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have a strong enough strategic direction yeah. to be focused. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing we did when I got there was to review that and say, where is the organization going and where does it want to go? Yeah. We had goals of wanting to be the continent's best, <laughs> but we didn't have plans on how to get those goals. Yeah. And so we just put those plans, the six pillars that I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. and then aligned every leader and everybody in the organization to those six pillars. Mm -hmm. Once you get that alignment, you remove uh, opposition, you remove uh, practice that uh, doesn't drive towards achievement of those, mm -hmm. you get results. Absolutely. It's that simple. So you structure the organization around the strategy, you structure your resourcing, your capex, your opex, everything you do around the strategy, mm -hmm. you will achieve it. Yeah. And so I'm very proud to, to have led that process, yeah. but also to have achieved the results that we did. And uh, now that we're going into the second strategic review, for the next three to five years, it will be interesting what our goals are in terms of profit and dividend payments going forward for shareholders. Uh, I think when we release it, uh, the market will like that. Wow. Thank you so much for your time, Martin, and congratulations. Keep doing what you're doing. There you have it. That's uh, Martin Ochieng, and uh, he's quite optimistic about what to expect on this particular company. I'll leave you right now to the market.